I enjoy doing all of it, you know, and I think all of it makes the other things better. I think being a comedian makes me a better actor, which makes me a better writer, and being a better writer makes me a better comedian, makes you a better producer. I think everything sort of feeds into each other. The more you see other sides of the process, I think the better. My name is Kamel Nanjiani, and this is the timeline of my career. Who can tell me what this is? Anybody know? Is it a semi-automatic assault weapon? <laughs> no, it's not. It's what's called a snowmobile. It's possible. You could be right. The first time I'd ever done anything on TV was Saturday Night Live, which feels like something people do many, many years in. Basically, I just moved to New York. I was doing open mics, and I met this guy who was a writer for SNL. And they needed a brown guy for a sketch. And he just contacted me and he said, hey, do you wanna be on Saturday Night Live? And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, we have a sketch and you'd have some lines. And I said, okay. I was very, very scared. The cast was in, in the scene and they had little lines. I was the only one who was not part of the cast who had lines. But I remember Will Forte was right behind me and he was very, very nice. He said, you know, just, don't be nervous, just read the cards, it'll be fine. He saw that I was nervous. Daryl Hammond was very nice, Kristen Wiig was very nice. I did the dress rehearsal. I had three lines and one of them didn't go great. And so they cut that line. So then when we actually did it, I had two lines. I was extremely nervous, but it went well. That was my first credit. And then I wasn't on Saturday Night Live for 11, 12 years. It took 11, 12 years to come back there. I hadn't really considered being on camera or being an actor at that point. I was just sort of writing stand-up comedy. I'd never even written for a TV show. So it really felt like I jumped up a few steps and I was like, all right, Hollywood, here I come. That did not happen. This is Sophie and uh, her nanny, Walter. Get him through a service? Uh, yep. Yeah? Yep. He's your cab driver, isn't he? Yep. Yeah. So this guy, Greg Berlanti, who's since created The Flash and all the DC shows on, you know, on TV, a, a, a true genius. He was directing a movie called Life As We Know It with Katherine Heigl. And I just went in an audition for it and I improvised and Greg liked me and he put me in the movie. And I remember just sort of improvising during all the scenes. And I was like, all right, here we go. My life's gonna be completely different once this movie comes out. Did not happen. But it was very fun, I had a great time. Life As We Know It was one of the first auditions I did. And I, I, I got the part and I was like, oh, this stuff is really, really easy. Here we go, let's buy a boat. None of that happened. But I will say that was the biggest part I'd had in a movie for many, many, many years. After that, I would get little parts and stuff, but life as we know it, I believe I had three scenes in that. And for about seven or eight years, that was the biggest part I'd had in a movie. Hey, welcome to Disaster Hut. So I'm just gonna ask you some basic questions. Earthquakes, typhoons, tornadoes, super virus, big landslides, you name it, we handle it. Let's talk beans. Beans. I met Fred Armisen at Bumbershoot, which is a music festival in Seattle that also does some comedy shows. And I had just had a profile in the New York Times, like a sort of a new up and coming guy. And I was a huge fan of Fred's, you know. And I have this thing when I meet someone who I'm a big fan of, I don't want to fan out. And so, so sometimes I'll go the other way and end up actually being rude because I don't want them to know I'm a fan of them. Fred was like, hey, really great profile in the New York Times. And I think I was like, yeah, I know. And I just walked away. And then I was like, that was a huge mistake. And then a uh, couple months later, oh my God, all these things are connected. I had done a recurring bit on Colbert Report right after SNL. And the director of that, her name's Al, uh, then went on to do Portlandia, and I ran into her in New York on a subway. So much luck, so much luck. She just was like, hey, I have something for you that I think you might be good at. And I said, okay, sure, whatever you want, you know, I'll take. And then I got an email that said that Carrie Brownstein of Slater Kinney and Fred Armisen, who I had been rude to very recently, we're gonna do a new sketch show on IFC, which hadn't really done a lot of original programming at the time. And I talked to the director of that show, John Kreisel, and he was like, I'm gonna send you a script, I'm gonna send you a script, this is what it's about. It's basically about a guy who is trying to upsell them on a cell phone plan. And I kept waiting for the script and the script just never came, it just never came. 
So I went in without a script. There was no script. Turns out most of that show is improvised. They have a very loose idea where they're go going. My call time was like six. We started shooting at 7 a.m. And by 8.30, I was done. And I remember we laughed so much during it. It was so much fun. And Fred and Carrie were so funny. And I'd never seen a sketch show like that. And I was like, that was weird. That was the easiest shoot I've ever had. But I think that was really fun. I think it could be really, really good. And it led to every job I've had since then. Most birthdays in Pakistan, a monkey shows up. <laughs> All right. The fact that you just, just accepted that <laughs> is racist. <laughs> but it also does happen. So having like an hour long comedy special to me was sort of, that's how you know you've arrived as a comedian. Before that it was have to be on Letterman. I got to do Letterman and then it was like, all right, I need an album and I need an hour special. And I've been doing stand up for a long time, but my, my stand up voice had kind of changed. So even though I'd been doing stand up for about, wow, 10 years at that point, a lot of those jokes weren't usable anymore. They just weren't funny coming out of my mouth anymore. So basically those were all jokes that I'd written in the last two or three years. I did an hour, I recorded it in Austin. I had a great time. Very proud of that special. I would change the wardrobe. I didn't realize that that's like around forever. And I remember being like, wow, I really crushed that outfit. And it's just like a very loose flannel, the very loose hoodie, no haircut. What a disaster. My parents saw the special. They really liked it, but you know, I think for them it was a little bit of an adjustment. I was such a shy kid, they had not anticipated their son becoming like a comedian or an actor. Initially, they weren't very vocal with their support, but whenever I'd go to their house, there would be reviews and newspaper articles and pictures of me up everywhere. So I knew they were proud of me. And now they talk about it a lot more. Pindar Singh? Yes? I'm J.D. Athera with CIB. Good God, we're both brown, brother. I expect to be harassed by the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, the TSA, but not one of my own. So Franklin and Bash happened because right before that, I'd written on a show called Michael and Michael Have Issues, and they wanted the writers, which was just me and Jesse Klein, who later went on to be like the head writer of Inside Amy Schumer, amazing writer. They wanted us to be in the show. So we wrote the first season, I was in that show, I had a great time acting, and we started writing the second season, we got canceled as we were writing the second season, and that was really heartbreaking. I was like, oh, I, I don't want to be that involved with the show anymore. That is like super heartbreaking when it goes away. So as soon as it went away, I was like, all right, I like acting. I just want to like see if I can get an acting job. I'll be a little bit more chill about it. Let's just see if that happens. So I flew out to LA and I stayed at my friend's house. And there's a thing called pilot season, or it used to be a thing. It's not so much a thing anymore where two or three months, they're just sort of casting all the new shows that are going to get shot, the new pilots that are going to get shot. So I ended up auditioning for so many pilots. I didn't get any of them. And then I flew back to New York and I was like, oh, that's too bad. That didn't work out. And then I put myself on tape for one more show. Uh, it was a show called Franklin and Bash on TNT starring Mark Paul Gosseler and Brecken Meyer. And they flew me out. I remember I tested for it, which is sort of the last round of auditioning. And then I got the part and I was very excited because I was like, okay, I, I get to now act and I, I don't have to like write anything for a little while. Th that moved us out to LA and uh, yeah, started shooting that show. I had no idea what I was doing, but everyone was very supportive. That's sort of unfortunately the show where I kind of figured out how to act, how to be on set, all that kind of stuff. Ended up doing that show for three seasons. It was just great for the first time in my life having a paycheck that was consistent from comedy. You know, I hadn't had that. I had an office job when I was doing stand-up in Chicago, but suddenly I was making regular money from acting and that felt amazing. And we only shot for, I think, four or five months out of the year. And so the rest of the year, I was able to do what I wanted to do. I could write the kind of stuff I wanted to write. I could do stand-up and I didn't have to worry about paying my rent. I mean, I didn't want to go back to having an office job, but I guess if it came to it, I'm just getting really scared thinking about it. Hey, maybe it could still happen. He didn't actually do anything wrong. He worked for Endframe, the pieces of shit that stole our algorithm. Yeah, so by the transitive property, he is therefore also a piece of shit. Well, uh, the pieces of shit fired him. So his piece of shit status is reversed. Okay, fine. So the transitive property may no longer apply, but the reflexive property states everything is equal to itself. So since he's a piece of shit, he's a piece of shit.
So I'd done Franklin and Bash for three seasons. It's sort of this drama procedural, and uh, even though my character got to be funny, I really wanted to be on a show that was a pure comedy. So I talked to the creators of that show, Kevin Falls and Bill Chase, really, really lovely guys, and I was like, I love the show, I love you guys, I love working with everyone, but I really, really feel like I want to be on a show where that's like a true sitcom, a real, like a comedy comedy. And they understood and they said, okay, well, we'll let you out of the contract, if you'll do one more season, because usually a contract is for seven years and nobody lets you out, but these guys are so nice. They were like, okay, do seven out of 10 episodes and then you can audition for other stuff. So while I was shooting Franklin and Bash, I heard that there was a new show by Mike Judge, who I was a huge fan of from Beavis and Butthead and Office Space, huge, huge fan. That he had a new show on HBO and if I wanted to audition for it. And I heard this, I remember before Christmas and my audition was like mid-January. So entire Christmas, I was super nervous. I was like, oh my God, this sounds like a dream job. I would love to do this with this guy on this channel. It's gonna be so good. I auditioned for two parts on the show and the auditions went well, but they, they called me you know, and said, we really like you. We don't think you're right for either of these parts, but don't worry, we're gonna write a part for you. Now, people always say that, that never happens. That never happens. That's a way of being like, sorry, you didn't get it. So I was like, oh my God, that's too bad, I didn't get it. Then I was on a flight, I remember, I forget where, and then I landed, I had a voicemail, and they said that I'd gotten an offer to be in Silicon Valley, that they'd written a part for me. I remember on the phone being like, yes, I'll do it. And they were like, well, we have to play a little bit hard to get it. And I was like, okay, whatever you gotta do. And then like, I think the next day, Mike or one of the head writers called to convince me to do it. And I was like, yeah, guys, I'm doing the show. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I got nothing else going on. Yeah, I ended up doing that show for six seasons. Uh, one of the, just the best experiences of my life. And that show just ended just a few months ago. I'm very sad that the show's over. I'm gonna miss everybody I worked with. We really became a family, but I'm also glad that we got to end the show on our own terms. And you get six seasons from a comedy today. I mean, so rare, hard to complain. I know you guys said that you don't need me to stay, but I think I'm just gonna wait anyway. You guys broke up. I'm, I'm not sure why you're here. You, you don't have to worry about being committed to anything, Kamel. You didn't want to when she was awake. There's no need to do it when she's unconscious. It's more complicated than that. Is it? So a few years had gone by since the events of the film, and I'd sort of started thinking, I think this would be an interesting story to tackle. I knew nobody else had this story. It was a story about a Pakistani Muslim man who falls in love with a white woman white American woman while she's in a coma. I knew nobody else had that story and that if we didn't tell it, that story would just not get told. So I, I, I'd started thinking like, maybe this is something to tackle. There was a lot about it that ha we hadn't processed yet. And so I mentioned it to Emily. I said, I think we need to write it. And initially Emily was very hesitant. You know, she was sort of like, I don't know, it feels too personal. We're still dealing with the sort of the trauma of it. Is this something we want to do? What I didn't realize was what an act of therapy it would be to sort of really go through and think about those days, you know, because it was such a crazy thing. Every day was so intense and weird. And then suddenly it was done and she was awake and she was fine. And that experience was like this black box that I never looked into. And then in writing the movie, we really had to sort of open up and sift through and try and remember what it felt like to go through that stuff. And it really ended up being very therapeutic to, to do that. We had written this story, we had shot this story, this movie, we, we loved the movie, we really, really worked really, really hard on it. I had not considered the idea that anybody would watch this thing. We didn't make it for it to be watched, we just made it. I had not even considered that people would watch it. So I remember we were at Sundance, I got into Sundance, we were sitting there the movie was about to start. We were in this huge theater, like 1,500 people. Eccles Theater is called. It's the biggest theater in Sundance. And Emily looked over to me and said, you know, this is the last time that this is going to be our story. Now it's going to sort of belong to other people. And that was the first time it sort of hit me. I was like, oh, yeah, other people get to watch this thing. We can't just like, it's not just our little thing anymore. And so that was definitely an adjustment. And Emily had prepared herself for it mentally. I had really not prepared myself for it. 
And so doing that and suddenly putting a lot of personal stuff out there was kind of weird because now suddenly people knew everything about us. I really pour myself into the things I do and I really care, but as soon as it's done, I've sort of moved on. So by the time the big set came out, even though we promoted it a lot, we were sort of done with that movie. We'd processed that story, we'd written it, we'd shot it, we'd edited it. We were kind of done with it, you know? And then that's, it's, that's the other weird thing is that people want to talk about something when you're actually done with it and you've moved on so to me there's I never feel like I want to enjoy the success of anything because I feel like oh that's the past version of me what can this version of me do you know maybe that's the only good thing I'll ever do so now I've got to keep going find something else you totally killed tonight, killed tonight. did you guys see a little boy killed tonight. the twilight zone so I'd done a little part on Key and Peel years ago, and I knew Jordan a little bit. For Big Sick, when we were sort of doing the award circuit thing, that was the same year that Get Out had come out and was sort of, you know, getting nominated and winning. So we would see Jordan at all the same parties almost every day, and we became really close, we became friends. And then he called me and he said, we're rebooting The Twilight Zone. Would you want to be in an episode of it? And I was like, are you kidding? That's a dream come true. I grew up loving the Twilight Zone, still love the Twilight Zone, love Jordan, such a huge fan of this. So I was like, yeah, I would love to do it. And they kind of pitched me the story. And I really, it really felt very personal to me. I really connected to it as a comedian. And I said, that sounds great. And it's not like any kind of, it felt to me like a good update of Twilight Zone and that it felt like the old Twilight Zone, but it was about new things, about issues that are current in society right now. And uh, yeah, so that one was very easy. They asked me and I said, yes. Shooting it was different because it's to this day the darkest part I've ever played. But I remember I was really exhausted when I was done with it, even though it was only like a 10 day shoot or something, it was very short. And I was like, oh, I guess that's, this sort of must have played some sort of toll on me because it was only 10 days, but by the end I was like emotionally completely drained. It was, but it was really, really fun playing like, like a truly scary guy who, who really did some <laughs> pretty bad things. Only in America do you add tax after you see the ticket price. Only in America can such a perfect game exist. Baseball. Our friend Lee Eisenberg, who I'd done a pilot with many, many years ago at Comedy Central that didn't end up getting made. But we sort of kept in touch since then, and Lee had this idea for a TV show I want to tell you guys about. And right after The Big Sick had come out, a lot of people have been contacting us, wanting to sort of, wanting us to be involved in TV shows or movies. And to this day, Little America is the only thing that we've said yes to together because it just was such an undeniably great idea. It just, I was like, there's no show like this. There's hundreds of TV shows now. There are more TV shows now than ever in history. And we're the only show that's an anthology show telling stories based on true lives of immigrants. We really wanted to have the actors be people who are really connected to the story in terms of country of origin and, and things like that. That. So it just felt like this was a platform to give chances to other actors who hadn't gotten that chance to sort of be the lead of something yet. So I was just really excited to be behind the scenes and, and watch other people do the difficult stuff, you know? Not that my job wasn't difficult, but theirs was more. I found out that I was going to be in Eternals, which is a Marvel movie that comes out later this year. November 6th. I found out a year before we started shooting that I was gonna be in the movie. This was like eight or nine months before, you know, they announced it or the story got leaked that I was gonna be in it. So I was like, okay, this is how much time I have. I need to get into the best shape of my life because I was playing the first Pakistani, first South Asian superhero in a mainstream Hollywood movie, certainly the first one in a Marvel movie. And it was important to me that this guy looked like somebody who could hang with Thor or Captain America or any of these guys. You know, I didn't want the first brown superhero to also be the first schlubby superhero. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna get in the best shape of my life. And while we were working on Little America, was while I was really in the thick of doing the training and the diet and all of that. So I remember I would go into the edit of Little America right after going to work out. And all the people involved with that show knew why I was doing it. So I, my, my, my memories of working on Little America are, are intertwined with my memories of doing very, very difficult, soul-crushing workouts all the time. Those are very, very linked. Yeah, it took a long time. <laughs>
How do I feel about how it's all turned out? So far, it's been okay. I feel like if there are infinite parallel universes, this is the only one where I'm being interviewed by Vanity Fair on my career. So I feel very, very lucky. I, I feel just very, very lucky that I've been able to do the things that I've gotten to be able to do. But I also know things can turn very quickly in this biz. You can have opportunities, suddenly they can go away. Which is why it's always about the next thing, you know? Uh, what's the next thing that's gonna be exciting that'll hopefully happen and hopefully people will connect to. So, so I don't think of it as a whole career thing. I just think of it as what do I want to do right now and what do I want to do next?